Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, after years of demands from victims, a new defense minister says yes. This is a really important step for, you know, proper accountability. Why military sexual misconduct cases are moving under civilian control. Also tonight, Air Canada's CEO apologizes why his words cut so deep in Quebec. This is a bit of a powder keg inside of a dynamite factory. Rosie and Ad Issue are here on our top stories. New strategies to calm fears, not of the vaccine, but of the needle. My uh, brain and my body just do not let me get this injection. And Canada's soccer superstar and his adoring hometown. Every time I put on that jersey, I fight for this country. Edmonton gets pumped for the return of Alfonso Davies. This is The National. Canada's new Minister of National Defence has made her first big move to address the sexual misconduct crisis in the Canadian Armed Forces. That crisis has rocked the military over the last few months, hitting several senior leaders and shaking confidence in the military's ability to investigate itself. And now that practice is changing with an announcement that sexual misconduct cases from within the military will now move outside it to the civilian justice system. It's a big move, but not a new idea. As Ashley Burke shows us, it's something many have been calling for for a long time. The Honorable Indira Anita Anand, Minister of National Defense. She's been Defense Minister for just over a week, but today Anita Anand followed through on a long-standing demand. It is extremely important that the survivors of sexual misconduct in the military have recourse to the civilian legal system. Anand said the government will act on a recommendation by former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour transfer military sexual misconduct cases to civilian police to investigate and courts to prosecute. It's fantastic. I think it's something that victims have been asking for for a long time. There's always been concern that the military can't investigate itself, particularly when it comes to senior leaders. Skepticism that our board cites as justification for this move. She's reviewing the military sexual misconduct crisis Seven senior leaders have been placed under military police investigation this year, including Admiral Art McDonald, who's on leave as Chief of Defense Staff and denies wrongdoing. Arbour wrote immediate remedial actions are necessary to start restoring trust in the CAF. Her request based on a landmark report by another former Supreme Court justice earlier this year. The fact that the minister has shown uh, an intention to act positively and with urgency on urgent recommendations is comforting. I was terrified. The move could have an impact on cases like Stephanie Vios. The retired Canadian Forces member went public in March, alleging she was raped by Vice Admiral Hayden Ebenson aboard a Navy ship in 1991. He denies the allegation. Vio's lawyer recently found out her case is now with civilian prosecutors to determine if criminal charges will be laid. This is a really important step for, you know, proper accountability and um, ensuring that, you know, other cases in future aren't, uh, you know, uh, you know, swept away or hidden away. Hmm. Okay, so Ashley, how soon could other cases now be moved over? Well, Andrew, there's no timeline yet. Anand said that consultations are already underway, and they first have to come up with a process to transfer these cases over to civilians. As of right now, this is all an interim measure until military police put in place more rights for complainants. But if Justice Arbour later determines it should be a permanent move, Anand said that she'll act on that. Okay, Ashley Burke, thank you. Thank you. Canadian Olympic sprinter Andre de Grasse's coach is facing allegations of sexual misconduct tonight. Raina Ryder's lawyer confirms the U.S. Center for Safe Sport has launched an investigation, but adds Ryder hasn't received any evidence about the claims. Ryder helped coach DeGrasse to his three Tokyo 2020 medals and has also coached other international track athletes, including DeGrasse's partner, a hurdles world champion. DeGrasse's management agency told CBC Sports it has no comment. The CEO of Air Canada has apologized after comments he made about his lack of French language skills. As Alison Northcott explains, it comes just as a debate heats up in the province over the French language law. 
Air Canada CEO Michael Rousseau has lived in Montreal for 14 years. When a francophone reporter asked him how that's possible while speaking so little French, Rousseau couldn't understand the question. I, can you redo that in English? The exchange came after the CEO delivered a speech to the Montreal Chamber of Commerce almost entirely in English. He told reporters he's too busy to learn French. I've been able to live in Montreal without speaking French. Um, and I think that's a testament to the city of Montreal. That's an insult for all the Quebecers because the official language here is French. At Quebec's National Assembly, politicians were unanimous. Some people are nostalgic of an era when all the big boss were anglophone and were only talk English. I'm not buying his excuse. Like, I'm a CEO, multimillionaire, and I don't have time to learn French. It comes during a debate in Quebec around a bill to strengthen the French language law amid fears French is on the decline. This is a bit of a powder keg inside of a dynamite factory. Mitch Garber is an anglophone business executive based in Montreal. I'm hoping to be able to lower the flame a little bit because most Anglo-Quebecers who have chosen to stay and live in Quebec don't feel that they don't need to learn or speak French. Are there many Anglophones who don't want to learn French? I don't, I don't see. I think, I think the CEO of uh, Air Canada is more the uh, exception than the rule. Instead of being stub stubborn, they should think of our language. Today, Rousseau promised to improve his French, saying in no way did I mean to show disrespect for Quebecers and Francophones across the country. I apologize to those who were offended. Canada's official languages commissioner says Air Canada normally generates about 85 complaints a year. Today alone, there have been more than 200. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. There's a developing story tonight in Mexico after a shooting at a popular resort near Cancun. So these are pictures tweeted out by frightened hotel guests who'd been rushed into hiding after shots were fired. Authorities later said two suspected drug gang members were dead in what's been described as a beachfront shootout. They said no hotel guests were seriously injured. CBC News spoke with a Canadian who hid in one of the hotel's rooms during the shooting. I just kept thinking, am I in in sandals am i running fast enough i don't you don't feel like you're running fast enough you don't know what you're running from uh and you the the entire not knowing is probably the scariest part just weeks ago two tourists were killed during a gang shootout at another mexican resort well, CBC News has exclusive details about an investigation into whether the clothing some Canadians buy could be funding North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Our colleagues at CBC Marketplace spent months poring over shipping records. David Common has the story. This is one of the busiest ports in North America, Newark, New Jersey, where U.S. authorities have blocked clothing shipments from a Chinese factory suspected of using forced labor. The allegation is that North Korean citizens were being brought into China, held at the factory. They were being restricted in terms of movement. Their travel documents had been seized. Two years ago, the UN banned the use of North Korean migrant workers because it believes the regime of Kim Jong-un sucks away their earnings. Anywhere between 70 to 100 percent is taken by the state. This leading researcher says North Korea wants the workers' foreign earnings to support its prohibited nuclear weapons program. If it isn't funding that program um, directly, it is funding it indirectly by freeing up other funds. This is the suspect factory in China. Dozens of workers rubbing their hands and shoulders after hours of work. And our undercover team repeatedly hears that many workers here are North Korean. The Dandong region of China, where the factory is located just across from North Korea, has faced questions about forced labor before. A Chinese government program even advertised North Koreans as obedient, who will work long hours at lower cost. This footage, rare and dangerous to record, likely never seen outside China before. The factory itself denies anyone is North Korean. Canada's Reitmans has been buying a small fraction of their clothes from that factory for a decade. Reitmans tells Marketplace forced labor is banned from their supply chains and their unannounced audits 
did not uncover any North Korean workers. But after serious concerns were raised last year, Reitman says they stopped new orders from this factory. Nine months later, though, what had already been ordered is still being sold at Reitman's owned Pennington's, bothering many shoppers. It surprises me, and it's so disappointing. The allegations making more and more shoppers consider where their clothes come from and at what cost. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. You can check out the full results of Marketplace's investigation tomorrow. That's at 8 p.m. on CBC Gem and CBC Television, 8.30 in Newfoundland. B.C. Premier John Horgan has been diagnosed with throat cancer. Doctors confirmed the diagnosis after conducting a biopsy on a growth in his neck last week. In a statement, Horgan says his prognosis is good and he expects to make a full recovery. He adds he will continue to participate virtually in briefings, cabinet meetings and other important meetings as he begins radiation treatment in the coming weeks. Well, the UK is now the world's first country to greenlight use of molnipiravir. It's a COVID treatment jointly developed by U.S. pharma giants Merck and Ridgeback, and it is the first pill shown to effectively treat COVID-19. Today's approval in the UK, it is conditional. Patients must be 18 or older with mild or moderate COVID symptoms and must have at least one risk factor for developing a serious disease, such as diabetes or obesity. Here in this country, Health Canada is still reviewing the drug. So there are all kinds of reasons why some Canadians aren't getting vaccinated. One of them, fear of the jab itself, needle phobia. Lindsay Duncombe explains the strategies being used to help them get protected. It's more than just a little trepidation that keeps Paul Friedlander from getting fully vaccinated. More like terror. My uh, brain and my body just do not let me get, get this injection. It took three visits to different clinics before the 12-year-old got his first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, thanks to a nurse named Rosa Kay. She spent over an hour, I would say, with Paul, talking him through it, having creative approaches. But when it came to the second shot, Paul just ran away. And it wasn't a uh, success, which was bad. Experts estimate that about a quarter of Canadians are scared of needles to some degree, but about 4% have a full-fledged phobia, and the number is likely higher in children. If you actually have a fear of needles, that can be the only reason that's preventing you from getting vaccinated. Researchers at the University of Toronto have developed a strategy to reduce fear-related hesitancy, and it's using videos like this to share the message. C is for comfort. Make sure you're comfortable when you get your vaccine. They call it the CARD system, standing for comfort, ask, relax, distract. It's the strategy the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto uses at special clinics for needle-phobic patients, adults and children. The cubicles are private, there are toys as distractions, and the staff take extra time. These adaptations are fairly simple strategies and I do think that a lot more effort can be made to just have them available in general clinics. That sounds a lot like how the nurse helped Paul get his first shot. His mom is trying to find her for the second dose. No luck yet. So what do you think? Do you think if, you, if we found Rosa, do you think maybe we would have a chance? Or do you think a it's... A big chance. Yeah? He hasn't given up on overcoming his fear. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce wants Ottawa to do away with PCR tests for travellers at the border. They say requiring a negative test on entering the country is expensive for families and bad for tourism. The Chamber also says it's unfair to quarantine children travelling with their parents because no vaccine has yet been approved for kids under 12. Nearly 800 workers with Toronto's public school board are on unpaid leave for refusing to reveal their vaccination status. And more than 1,000 said they have not gotten the shot. They have until November 19th to get their first dose. If they don't, they'll also be on unpaid leave as of the 21st. Healthcare spending in Canada is expected to surpass $300 billion in 2021. That would be an all-time high, according to a new report by the Canadian Institute for Health Information. 
That report warns of financial challenges ahead for provinces and territories as COVID-19 led to the single biggest increase in health spending Canada has ever seen. During the pandemic, many Canadians have given up their gym memberships, creating their own workout spaces at home. This is a trend gym owners hoped would be reversed as restrictions lifted. But as Jamie Strachan explains, so far that has not happened. Most mornings you can find Wendy Vincent in her garage, boxing gloves on, pounding the heavy bag. I've got my space heater, I've got my music. I'm happy to be home turf. Before the pandemic, every morning meant a trip to the gym. But after months working out at home, Vincent cancelled her membership. Just my comfort level and my peace of mind of not being in the gym amongst people, people who might not be distancing, this is just safer for me. I'm more comfortable. It's a familiar story. After nearly two years of closed doors, tight safety protocols and capacity limits, gyms across the country are struggling to bring people back. Our industry has been decimated. Most clubs have lost 50 to 90% of their membership and across Canada, over a third of fitness facilities have already permanently closed their doors. Peloton, come on, let's get this workout started. Clubs have also had to deal with a wave of new fitness players like Peloton, Lululemon and even Apple who have disrupted the industry. I definitely don't want it to be the end for us. For Christy Kennedy, it's meant closing the doors on a business she spent years building. It's not just a job, it's my, it's who I am, it's what I do and I uh, really care about all the people, so it's been really hard. At its peak, her club had about 700 members, a number that slowly dwindled as the pandemic wore on. We were trying to make it through the summer, but our memberships, again, were down about 50%. Um, we could no longer afford the facility that we're in. Our rent was just too much for the amount of people we had coming. Desperate for a lifeline, the industry is calling for gym memberships to be made tax deductible. There's also hope that people are looking for a change of scenery people who bought that equipment and had that at home have only raised their confidence that they can now walk into a fitness facility and do a great workout and have a great time and join their friends. But for now, people like Wendy Vincent have found their groove at home. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Whitby, Ontario. With soaring inflation, Canadians are paying more for just about everything, including food. And soon they could see a spike in the price of pasta. The problem isn't COVID or container ships, it's a shortage of pasta's main ingredient, durum wheat. Provinces like Alberta have had a tough summer of drought and high demand, plus low supply equals more expense for pasta makers. When it got up to over $20 a bushel, I mean, that's basically been unheard of in our industry. And of course, that's going to have a downstream effect. Now, so far, the price crunch hasn't hit the kind of mass-produced pasta you get at the supermarket, but for boutique suppliers and restaurants that make their own pasta fresh, it is a different story. At this point, we have no choice. When it's 20% and more, we're going to have to pass it on to our consumers. More unwelcome news when Canadians are already feeling stretched. Now let's turn to COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. The whole city once rose to economic prominence through the power of coal. Well, today it was the stage for global promises to end coal's use, though with some notable absentees. Carolyn Dunn explains. Nothing hazy about the message. The days of emissions spewing coal are numbered. I think we can say that the end of coal is in sight. More than 45 countries, including Canada, have pledged to halt investment in coal-powered generation and agreed to wean themselves off coal power entirely by 2030 or 2040, depending on the wealth of the country. Ending emissions from coal power is one of the single most important steps we must take. In his second week into his new job as Canada's Environment Minister, Gilbo spoke on behalf of the Global Alliance to power past coal a step that also improves overall public health. Emissions from coal are the single biggest contributor to climate change. So cancelling coal is essential to limit warming of the planet to 1.5 degrees. 
But youth climate activists at COP26 insist the pledge doesn't go far enough or fast enough for their future. Some of the world's most coal-dependent nations, including India, Australia and the United States, didn't sign the pledge at all. That, say activists, gives China, the world's largest emitter, the political cover it needs to keep increasing its coal use. China has uh, 1,200 plants operating now. They have plans to build 150 more. Um, and if there's a question of uh, what can we do about climate uh, right away, it, it's to not build any more coal plants. There are calls to cut some slack for countries with emerging economies and for wealthy nations like the US, UK and Canada to do the lion's share of cutting emissions and funding a greener energy transition. They've been polluting and taking up uh, an unfair share of the global atmosphere with their carbon pollution for over a century, and they have the wealth to show for it. Now, do they have the will to follow through on another ambitious pledge? Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Well, Canadian soccer superstar Alfonso Davies is returning to his hometown to make a run for the World Cup. Keeps it himself! Coming up, why he thinks Canada has a leg up on the competition. The weather, um, <laughs> the weather's going to be a challenge, you know, even for us Canadians. Plus, Anita Anand is quickly taking a different approach as Defence Minister. Will it make a difference? Rosie and the Ad Issue panel are here. And... Students at a Saskatoon school got a sudden and up-close lesson in Canadian wildlife. Okay, stop, stop. We're back in two. Alfonso Davies keeps it himself. Goal! Alfonso Davies, are you kidding me? <laughs> so good. Canadian soccer phenom Alfonso Davies with a brilliant goal in Canada's World Cup qualifier last month. A convincing 4-1 to win. So that brought Canada even closer to qualifying for the World Cup. And Davies is a huge reason why. Next up, two games in his hometown. Paige Parson looks at the excitement already bubbling there. Davies runs 80 yards to pick the pocket of coming. Soccer sensation Alfonso Davies has been wowing the world. Now he's headed home to Edmonton. For me personally, you know, it's like a, it's like a homecoming game. Brilliant run by Davis. The 21-year-old plays for highly ranked Bayern Munich and is key to the Canada men's team's efforts to qualify for the World Cup for the first time since 1986. Every time I put on that jersey, it's, it's you know, I, I fight for this country. You know, I do everything to, that I need to do for the team and to win games. Two upcoming games in Edmonton are a chance to get closer to making it to Qatar in 2022. Close to 40,000 fans will fill the stands when he steps on the field against Costa Rica next week. Davies says the Canadians have a secret weapon. The weather, um, <laughs> the weather's going to be a challenge, you know, even for us Canadians, but uh, for especially the, the Costa Ricans and the Mexicans. Davies isn't the only one prepared for the weather. We have some hand warmers and we go from there. But I think the suffering, even if it doesn't matter if it's minus 40, it's worth it, right? It's worth it to, to watch Canada play. Davies has been a longtime ambassador with this youth soccer club. For us, we feel like he's a very, very humble guy. Um, every time he's in the city, he always comes to the academy. He plays with the kids. Um, he brings, he brings like jerseys and stuff, balls. They snagged 600 tickets for players, coaches, and their families to watch the Mexico game on November 16th. It'll be their first chance to see their hero on the pitch. And it's something that they can see and almost feel, right? Because it's right in their city, so. This is a big motivational tool for everybody. Davy says the trip home will be a reminder of what it was like to be a kid with big dreams. I feel like I'm I'm back on the on the on the soccer pitch with uh, with the Edmonton Strikers and just having fun with uh, with some friends. He can't wait to put on a show for his hometown. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. Well, we told you last night that Sidney Crosby tested positive for COVID. Well, tonight, his coach has as well. Mike Sullivan is now off for several days under the NHL's COVID protocol. The Pittsburgh Penguins have been hit pretty hard by the virus since training camp, with Crosby and seven other players forced under league protocols to stay off the ice. Well, next on The National, Rosie's here with At Issue.
Andrew, tonight we are going to talk more about what of Anita Anand's first moves as defense minister. We're not sitting around waiting for anything to occur. How she's approaching her new job and what it means for real change inside the military. Chantal, Andrew and Althea will join all of us to talk about that right after this. It has been a little over a week since Anita Anand was sworn in as defense minister and already she's making changes, announcing today that military sexual misconduct cases will be moved to the civilian justice system. We're not sitting around waiting for anything to occur. The teams are in active discussions right now. This is all hands on deck. It's a move that follows the interim recommendations from former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour. Recommendations Arbour laid out in her letter last month to the former Minister of Defense. So what does this tell us, if anything, about how Minister Anand is approaching her new role? It's Thursday, I'm here with that issue. Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see everybody. Um, Chantelle, I'll start with you. How, how should we interpret uh, what the minister did today? Does it tell us anything about how she might be approaching this role differently than her predecessor? I guess up to a point, uh, I mean, she basically decided to implement today a recommendation that has been sitting on the Minister of Defense's desk for six years, uh, and which by now had become totally inevitable. But, I mean, good points for getting a second opinion that says the same thing six years yeah. later and following up on it. It, it, it is, Andrew, too, still uh, an interim recommendation. So the idea is we'll put it in place, we'll do it, and we'll either leave it or we'll figure out something else. So I'm not sure uh, whether there's any room, once you've started something, to, to dial it back. Uh, no, not on this on this file. I think okay. that train has left the station. This is, this is what's going to happen. I think uh, it's interesting that uh, you have a new minister here um, who clearly has a legal background that may be part of this, but who is also a new minister, and I suspect uh, the powers that be, i.e. the Prime Minister's office, would prefer that this was brought in with a new broom rather than having it done by the old minister who was a dead man walking for some time. Um, it, it's clearly this was needed when you had so many senior officers in the military who not only participated in this kind of sexualized culture, to use that phrase from the Marie Deschamps report, but more importantly, I think felt themselves to be invincible. Uh, and probably with good reason, it seems. So clearly, normal reforms, normal tinkering was not going to fix this. You had to take the, a much more sweeping approach to it. I think the other thing that this calls to mind is that, um, you know, the chain of command didn't just stop at the top of the military. It extends to the defense minister, who then reports to the prime minister. Uh, this has been a problem that's been on the prime minister's desk for six years, not just the defense minister's desk. And the fact that it took six years for this to happen, I think, shows some systemic problems in the way that we over oversight over the military. Uh, we need stronger legislative oversight. We can't just entrust it to the executive. Uh, Althea, what did you make of, of the, the move? Very quick off the mark for, for the minister. Uh, well, a few things. The letter was written on October 20th. Um, if the rumors that we were all hearing in Ottawa uh, were true, then one suspects that the that defense minister at the time, Harjit Shahja, knew that he was on his way out. So, you know, cabinet shuffle was just a few days later. It would have been in the government's interest to not have him act on that and to leave that yeah. for Anita Anon. So I think strategically, it is not that Anita Anon is suddenly more decisive than Harjit Shahja. Like, we, we can't say that. If anything, I would say, what this whole uh, episode this week is showing us is actually that Louise Arbour is the woman to watch because this recommendation, Chantal talked about it in the Deschamps report, but was also in the Justice Fish report. Oh, yeah. And when um, Minister Sajjan got that report um, earlier, well, in, on April 30th, when he responded to it, he ignored that recommendation. They, they worked on uh, several other recommendations, but this one they did not include. And um, part of the, her terms of reference for Madame Arbour are that she is to uh, give a report to the minister monthly about what she's doing. Mm -hmm. In her letter, if you read carefully, she now makes deadlines for the minister. She tells the minister, you must tell me monthly what you were doing on this file. Uh. So I think right now it's not so much that it's Anita Anand that we should be watching. Frankly, it's Louise Arbour that we should be watching. Th those, are, those are all good points. Chantal, you want it in there. Should we need... Uh six years and three former Supreme Court justices 
to point the mm. way yeah. to ministers and to the prime minister. I, I, I'm struggling with this. I think today's move was a good move, but I don't think it uh, kind of washes away six years. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 Andrew, that, that's your point. And, and I must say, for me too, I mean, I've read this recommendation three times now. So uh, at some point, the government had to move on it. Um, I, I'm not sure what has changed. Is it, is it the, the, the public's willingness to live with this? Is it the sheer volume of complaints there has been? Why, why is it happening finally? I think that's part of it, the sheer volume. It, yeah. it reaches a critical mass. Look, there's a reason why militaries have a separate judicial system. There are crimes in the military that don't exist in the civilian yeah. power. I understand why there'd be some reluctance uh, to, to, to make such a radical move. But at some point, when it's clear that you have institutional and cultural failings on such a scale, uh, I don't think there's any alternative. Um, Althea, do, I, I mean, how, how many times could the government have ignored this complaint? Were we just not sort of reaching the inevitable, uh, as, as I think it, it was Chantal who said? Well, I think in this case, we actually have to look at what Madame Morbourg is saying in her letter. What she's saying in her letter is that there is a crisis in, the, in terms of public perception, but also that the military itself is handicapped by its own rules. If senior leadership yeah. cannot know whether or not people are being investigated, they may make, as we have seen, uh, hirings and promotions that are, you know, if they had the full disclosure, they would not be making. And so in their own self-interest, not only in the interest of the victims, in the the DND's own interest, this is a recommendation that needs to be acted. I mean, she's very clear to say that, you know, this is an interim recommendation. It doesn't mean that this will be included in her final report. She may decide to go the other way. We probably all think that she won't, but um, she's decided that in her investigation at this point, yeah. this needs to be done now. What 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 would the it, military take? Oh, sorry, Andrew, go ahead. Yep. I just want to say one other lesson, it seems to me, to the extent that the minister was the issue rather than the prime minister is, uh, I'm not sure it's a great idea to appoint a military person to defense minister. Uh, there was a lot of ooing and aahing at the time of his appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think one of the problems that seems to have arisen is he was so steeped in that military culture and in all of the mores and lessons and histories there that perhaps was unable to really stand outside of it. Yeah, as we were talking about before, it's six years to the day when that first cabinet was appointed with Harjit Sajjan and the language at the time was very different than it is now, Chantal. It's also uh, the entire issue of dealing with this was not uh, was not uh, a part of the mandate letter right. that was given to that defense minister, notwithstanding the fact that the report sat on the prime minister's uh, desk and the prime minister was going around talking about parity and uh, women's rights and being a feminist prime minister. But... Um, I don't think we should blame the fact that uh, Arjit Sajjan was uh, from the military. We have had scores of defense ministers who were not, and by and large, they have allowed the military to do whatever it is that the military does, including this. Okay, we're going to take a quick break right there. When we come back with another roundabout issue, we're going to look at some of the backlash that these comments are getting. I've been able to live in Montreal without speaking French. Um, and I think that's a testament to the city of Montreal. The political response to those comments from the CEO of Air Canada's lack of French, that's coming up. I would love to be able to speak French. Um, a lot of my family has a French background, but right now my priority is ensuring that Air Canada gets back to where they were. That was Air Canada's CEO, Michael Rousseau, or Rousseau, probably as he would say it, answering questions on Wednesday about his lack of French. He's since faced significant political backlash, calls for him to resign even. Today, he apologized and committed to improving his French. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea back for another round of this. All right, Chantal, you start us off here. Um, in terms of what we should make of the political response to those kinds of comments. Well, it's pretty unanimous, uh, and I think it reflects uh, reality. It brings you back 50 years, if you're my age, to uh, a time when bosses spoke English and workers waited for orders, uh, French-speaking workers. This is Air Canada, a company that 
In my young days, used to forbid its French-speaking workers, including pilots, to speak French to each other, and didn't believe it was safe to speak French to land an airplane in Canada or elsewhere in the world where it was common practice. Um, the winners from this round uh, are is the CAQ government and its language legislation, which now has more momentum to make Bill 101 tighter. Uh, possibly the federal uh, new official languages act that treats French on a level different from English. Yeah. And the losers, uh, and today they were vocal about being the losers of this, are English Quebecers who are not uh, in any way, shape or form represented by the CEO of Air Canada and this, um, I don't have time to waste on learning French uh, issue. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, Mr. Rousseau didn't suddenly arrive in Montreal and, and was asked whether he should, he's been living in Montreal. That, that is where he chooses to live and I guess chooses to not learn French until today. Andrew, what did you make of the response? Well, that's part of what's so extraordinary about it. It'd be one thing if he was an American just in from Georgia, hadn't sure. really familiarized himself with the culture of the place. Uh, but for a president who's from Canada, of a company of all companies, Air Canada, you know, with its long history in Montreal, uh, it's really quite remarkable um, uh, um, and, and clueless. I mean, I'm not a fan of hearing politicians lecturing private citizens on what language they can speak. But if you are the president of any large corporation, let alone Air Canada, part of your job is to be attuned to local culture, local ideas, local prerogatives, local imperatives. And if you can't figure out in 14 years of living in <coughs> Quebec that it's going to be important that you at least make the effort to try to learn French. I mean, it's not so much that he didn't learn French, it's that he didn't seem to care about it. And it's not yes. even so much that he didn't care about yeah. it, it's that he said he didn't care yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, a, that's a three times level of cluelessness that uh, is really quite remarkable. Yeah, I mean, it, it is kind of surprising, Althea, that someone at that level in the business community living in Quebec would be, uh, I guess, blissfully unaware of how those comments would be received in Quebec. That to me was the most shocking thing. Like, has he not read any newspaper or turned on the television? Like, these debates are not just happening uh, in the French media. They're also happening in the English media when you're talking about Bill 101 or Bill 96 or mm -hmm. the federal government's uh, new language laws, that to me, the comments about like, well, isn't it a glorious thing that I've been living in Montreal for 14 years and I haven't had to learn French? Like that is a testament to the city. This is exactly the problem that we've been talking about for a decade yeah. in Montreal. And for him to cast it as in, in a positive light shows that he's completely oblivious to the discussion and doesn't even realize that he's giving ammunition to a side that doesn't agree with him <laughs> at all. Like it's it's mind boggling. Uh, Chantal, and that's that's the that's yeah, the go, shame in this is that yes. there's lots of reasonable people who are sympathetic to you know the cause of French in Quebec who are very concerned about Bill 96 and who feel it's overkill and indeed dangerous and they're going to be really put on their back foot by this. For sure, Chantal, last word. But he has also hurt Air Canada. It's going yes. to be harder for anyone who lobbies for Air Canada provincially or federally to get uh, to ministers to take a meeting with Air Canada is kind of made the company toxic. And that's too bad because there are lots of good people who work for Air Canada and they deserve better leadership. Yeah, and lots of people who speak both French and English and other languages too. Okay, thank you all. Uh, it was a good round this week. I'll see you next week. Appreciate it. And with that, let's send it back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. All right, thank you, Rosie. Next on The National, many Canadians are celebrating Diwali this week with food, family, and of course, music. But has the pandemic dimmed the festivities for another year? Plus, learning and search for knowledge can never stop. Hey, she knows what she's talking about and she's got proof. Stay with us. Diwali celebrations lighting up the skies over India. For South Asian families, it is one of the most important holidays of the year, a time for reflection and renewal. At India's borders, that meant soldiers, even those on opposing sides, coming together to exchange sweets. 
Now, for those marking Diwali in Canada, celebrations will be a little brighter this year with the return of some in-person events along with some familiar COVID safeguards. Benit Braich shows us how. We're just going to put out the offerings now. From Rangoli art, divas, sweets, and more, Diwali for this family is a vibrant celebration. But this year, they're spending it closer to home than usual. We're just keeping it a close family celebration because of COVID. Before the pandemic, the Bhatti has always celebrated Diwali in India, where they organized charity efforts aimed at providing free cataract surgeries to those in need. We th try to think of it as bringing literal light. For others, this year marks a return for more community connection. This year, people are excited. We do the full decorations on the temple and lighting and everything. The Wali has different histories and stories for Hindus, Sikhs, Jains and some Buddhists. Each has different ways of celebrating. At this Sikh Gurdwara, right across the Hindu temple, community members are gathering to celebrate the Wali in their own respective ways. Just here, clay oil lamps known as divas or diyas are being lit. Tonight, this will be blanketed with candles, surrounded by people, a symbol of light over darkness, good over evil. Community gathering is always happy, you know. And safety is a priority. We are uh, asking everybody to wear the mask when they come in. I think that we are still um, in the road to recovery from the pandemic and we wanted to provide options to people um, to be able to celebrate um, Diwali in some form. These dance performances are also part of a virtual showcase. Back at the Bhatias, this year may not be the Diwali they're used to, but they're optimistic. Diwali has become something that's a celebration of light, of family, of hope, of gathering together. Something she soon hopes to celebrate again in India. Benit Braich, CBC News, Surrey. It was a scary and pretty weird morning for kids and faculty at a Saskatoon school after a young female moose just crashed into class. Okay, stop, stop. Oh. This lost soul was first seen trotting around the city, very Canadian moment, but her wander came to an abrupt end at a nearby school. She was running and uh, I think what would have eventually happened is she got cornered and uh, she had one of two directions to go, and uh, unfortunately, she chose to jump through the window. That's how you clear a classroom pretty quickly. Just one student suffered minor cuts and scratches. Everyone else got out safely. And the moose, well, she had some minor injuries, but with a little help, she emerged safely. It may take her walks elsewhere. I'm pleased to report that the moose was uh, successfully tranquilized. Uh, once she was out of the city and in a safe location, we... Uh, we woke her up, and uh, she's on her way now. Gosh, poor thing. Okay, uh, after the break, we meet the Ontario grandmother breaking records at York University. My mind always was telling me, you are a student. Her impressive academic career is our moment. Next. Well, this is Vartha Shanmuganathan. She's 87 years old, and she's just earned her second master's degree. She graduated on Tuesday, in fact, officially making her the oldest person to earn a master's from York University. Her impressive academic achievement is our moment. From the age of four, I should say, I started my educational journey. My mind always was telling me, you are a student. Peace and nonviolence are the two topics that I cherish. I was writing my MRP about the causes of the Sri Lankan war. It was uh, interesting at the same time hard work. Younger students, because they were energetic, I felt uh, rejuvenated and uh, happy to talk to them and some of them came and uh, treated me like their own grandma. <laughs> Learning and search for knowledge can never stop. Uh, you should have the fire in you, that ambition, that passion. Age is not a barrier. 
<laughs> so first off, congratulations Absolutely. on the graduation. But I, I can't believe it. Her first master's degree, she started when she was in her 50s, the second one in her 80s. She thought about getting a, a PhD in, in political science, but thought, no, it's, that's enough. <laughs> well, let's add, let's add author of three books to right. those credentials. Interestingly, she said she got her, she chose York because it offers a tuition fee waiver for people over 60, which seems like a great idea. Congratulations. Oh. That is a national for November the 4th. Good night. Good night.